5. What is the use of a new good B? I repeat. What is the use of a new good B? Okay. You may be wondering why is the asking such a question. This was an answer given by the father of electricity, Sir Michael Faraday, when he invented a device called the electric generator. Now, as I said this much, you understand what topic I am going to discuss. The topic I am going to discuss is what is called EMI or electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic induction. In the previous, in one of the previous chapters, that was chapter number four, magnetic and moving charges and magnetism. We have seen that a current carrying conductor produces a magnetic field around it. Can the converse is possible that can a magnetic field produce a current? In search of that question, physicists like Sir Michael Faraday, Joseph Henry worked on that. And their observations is what we are going to study in the topic electromagnetic induction. So we will start with what is called the Faraday's experiment. So in one of the experiments, we have a coil, it is connected to a galvanometer. So what is the use of a galvanometer? A galvanometer will detect the presence of electric current. Now this magnet is plainly here. This magnet is plainly here. This is a north pole. This is a south pole. The magnet is plainly here. The other is not showing any reflection. The galvan, the magnet is now given a velocity v towards the coil. What they observe? They observe that the coil carries some current. Sorry, galvan shows some reflection when the coil is coming towards the. Oh, sorry, when the magnet is coming towards the coil. Galvanometer shows a deflection when the magnet is coming towards the coil. This is situation 1. In the second situation, so when the magnet was completely inside the coil, when the magnet was completely inside the coil, so here I will tell you, say, I am not showing galvanometer has shown such a deflection. When the magnet was completely inside the coil, the reflection reduces to zero. The reflection is zero. Now, the third situation that is when the magnet is leaving the coil. When the magnet is leaving the coil, now the arbitrage shows a reflection. But that reflection comes out to be in the opposite direction. Look at this figure. And let me tell you, this was a question for G-Main examination this year. The same question appeared for G-Main examination that we did. This question was there. Okay. So here, I'm sorry, this is the... In this case, the reflection is in this direction. This is the opposite direction. Fine. This is experiment number one. So what is the observation? What is the conclusion from here? When there is a relative motion between initial current is zero, relative motion between a coil and a magnet. A current is induced in the coil. A current is induced in 
the coil whenever there is a relative motion between the coil and the mouth edge. That is case one. In case two, instead of these two, this uh, they have taken two coils. So two coils. Okay, this one I am drawing drawing like this. Uh, Subclass coil. So it has got some sort of number of tens. It is connected to a battery. Now when both the coils are kept stationary with respect to each other, the reflection, the galvanic will be showing no reflection. When the coils are stationary with respect to each other, there is no deflection for the galvanometer. So in the second figure, now this coil is moved towards this coil with a velocity v. In this case, galvanometer shows a reflection. In this case, the galvanometer is showing a reflection. When this is moved towards this coil, galvanometer shows a reflection. In the third case, now when the coil is moved in, the, in, a, in a direction opposite to the initial direction, what is seen is Galvanic is showing a reflection, but in the opposite direction. So initially it was likewise. When there was no relative motion, this was the direction. When this is moving in this direction, the galvanic shows a reflection in this direction. This is the third case. Okay, in this case, it has to be something like this opposite direction. A current is induced here. A current is induced here which opposes. So, which means whenever there is a relative motion, whenever there is a, a relative motion between a current carrying coil. And a currentless coil, a current is induced. A current is induced in the lecture in the latter. A current is induced in the latter. Perhaps it is induced in both the coils as well. A current is induced in the latter because we are concerned only about the latter. In the third situation, we have the same first coil carrying a current, oh sorry, uh, connected to a galvanometer. Then the second coil I have just drawn, this connected by means of a cell and a switch. This is of experiment 3. The other one is experiment 2. In experiment 3, at present the reflection of the galvanometer is 0. Now the galvanometer is showing 0 reflection. I'm just pressing the key, galvanic shows reflection in one direction. When the key is pressed, galvanic is showing one reflection, which suddenly reduces the zero. At the instant, so there is a momentary reflection of the galvanic, momentary reflection. What reflection? There is a momentary reflection for the galvanic, momentary reflection only. There is reflection acting for a moment when, just when the key is just pressed. So, as the key remains pressed, the deflection reduces to zero. As the key remains pressed, the deflection reduces to zero. Now, in a similar way, if you just remove the key, galvanometer shows again a momentary reflection. Galvanometer shows again a momentary reflection. Now, let us come back to all these observations once more. First case, whenever there was a relative motion between the magnet and the coil, a current is induced in the coil. In the second case, whenever there was a relative motion between a current carrying coil and a currentless coil, and a current is induced in the currentless coil, initially where no current was there. And coming to the third observation, so there was a momentary deflection in this coil when you just press the key as well as you release the key. Momentary deflection. What deflection? There was a momentary deflection when you press the key as well as release the key. 
As long as mean, if the key remains pressed for a long time, there is no current in the Okay, what is the cause of all this? What causes all these fields and domain? To study that concept, we need, or to study about that, we need a new idea. And that is called the magnetic flux. So, my question, what do you mean by electric flux? You know it. What do you mean by electric flux? It is the relative number of electric field lines intercepted by an engine. Relative number of electric field lines intercepted by an engine. Just like the way we can define magnetic flexors, relative number of magnetic field lines intercepted by an So magnetic flux may be defined as the relative number of magnetic field lines intercepted by an area. So which means what we have to say is that okay, suppose that this is an area and these are certain magnetic field lines here. Then we have to say that if D5 represents magnetic flux, phi can be written as integral B dot ds. Phi is equal to d dot ds. That is surface integral of magnetic field. All this is surface integral b ds cos theta where theta is the angle between the magnetic field vector and the area vector. Theta is the angle between magnetic field vector and area vector. Now from here one more thing we can say if B is a constant, if magnetic field is a constant, implies magnetic flux phi is equal to what we can say B into integral ds cos theta. Integral ds cos theta. Or for uniform field. Acting at a constant angle. Uniform field acting at a constant angle. The magnetic flux in that situation will be equal to B S cos theta or B A cos theta. Whatever it be, there is no problem for that. Whether it is B S cos theta or B A cos theta, both are same only. So it is B S cos theta. That is the formula for magnetic flux. Now the question comes, what is the SI unit of magnetic flux? SI unit of magnetic flux. SI unit of magnetic flux is Weber. Weber, WB. It is Weber. WB is the unit for magnetic flux. Weber. Okay. The dimensional formula for magnetic flux we will find out later. That you will find out, not me. We will, uh, you will find out the dimensional formula for magnetic flux that we will do later. Okay. Now we will come to the next idea that is Faraday's laws. Okay. Let us take the first experiments once more. Coming to the first experiment, look at this. These are magnetic field lines around us. Now what happens? So I will show you different instances when the uh, me, let me take the cross section for it. Initially it was here. So field lines. So when the magnet was at rest, when the magnet was at rest, the flexing into the coil is a constant. When the magnet was at the at rest, the flex cylinder with this coil was a constant. Right? When the magnet was at rest, the flex cylinder with this coil was a constant. Now, when this is moved with the velocity d, what happened? Now we have to say that as it comes closer, more and more field lines will be intercepted 
by the coil. More and more field lines are intercepted by the coil, which means the flux linked with the coil is now changing. When it comes uh, comes towards this one, the flux linked with the coil is changing. Flux linked with the coil is changing. Now that's what I'm coming to. So according to this thing, the flux linked when the flux linked with the coil is changing, a current is induced. When the flux is a constant, there is no current induced. When flux changes, there is a current induced. So let me take the first law. Whenever there is a change in magnetic flux linked with a coil. A current or EMF is induced in the coil. Whenever there is a change in magnetic flux linked with the coil, a current or EMF is induced in the coil. The second point, or that one can otherwise say. A rate of change, a rate of change of magnetic flux. A rate of change of magnetic flux induces a current or EM. The rate of change of magnetic flux induces a current or EMF I have said. That is first law. The second law is what is called a uh, Lenz's law. And according to the Lenz's law, the direction of the induced current, the direction of the induced current is to oppose the cause oppose the cause cause that produces the cause that produces the change in flux The direction of the induced current is to oppose the cause, the cause that produces the change in flux. So taking everything into consideration, I can say induced dm of epsilon is equal to d phi by dt. And we will put a minus. The reason for this minus being opposing the cause. This is the induced dm. And similarly, the induced current I is equal to epsilon by r which is minus 1 by r into d phi by dt. But since i is equal to dq by dt, dq by dt means dq is the induced charge, right? Induced charge for every time. We have to say dq by dt is equal to minus 1 by r into d phi by dt or dq is equal to minus d phi divided by r. This is another important thing. Now the question I to ask on what factors induce the EM of difference? On what factors induce the EMF depends? So induced EMF depends on what factors? One, induced EMF bar current. One, change in magnetic flux. I'm saying change in flux. What you understand is change in magnetic flux. 
the second fact problem is the induced delay of bar current difference is time taken to cause the change in flux time taken to cause the change in flux the time taken to cause the change in cause the change in flux also is what these two things depends now on what factor does the induced charge depends Okay, so I have the freedom to do this. On what factors does the induced charge depends? Induced charge depends. Now you can see that the induced charge depends on what? Only on the change in flux. Oh, sorry. Induced charge depends only on changing flux. Why you can understand? Look at this expression. To get the equation d2 is equal to minus d5 by r. So induced charge depends on the changing flux and the resistance of the coil. R is the resistance of the coil. R is the resistance of the coil. So you have to understand this. Further, we have induced EMF. EMF of a cell is defined as the work done by the electric field. In order to take a charge in a closed path, include the cell closed integral E dot dl. You study this formula. This is equal to minus E phi by d. Closed integral E dot dl and its value is equal to minus d phi by dt. So this electric field is called a induced electric field. This electric field is called a induced electric field. Now, what is this term? Is that term equal to zero? No. So since work done, E dot dl is work done per unit charge. Since work done per unit charge is not equal to zero over a closed path. Since work done per unit charge is not equal to zero over a closed path. Means what? Induced electric field. Electric field is a non-conservative field. Induced electric field is a non-conservative field because work done is not zero over a closed path. Work done is not zero over a closed path. So I have to say that the induced electric field is a non-conservative field. It's a non-conservative field because work done is not equal to zero over a closed path. A conservative field means, as you know, work done is zero over a closed path. Induced electric field is a non-conservative field because work done is not zero over a closed path. Again, I will say that induced electrostatic field lines are closed field lines. Induced electric field lines, not electrostatic. Induced electric field lines form closed field lines. We have studied in electrostatics that electrostatic field lines never form closed loops. But I would say induced electric field lines always form closed loops. Induced electric field lines always form closed loops. I hope this aspect is very clear to you. Okay, so thank you.